on the other side of the grill are Muslims, and they tell a different story. This is the Muslim side, and the reason they revere Abraham is because, as well as Isaac, he had another son, Ishmael, the father of the Arabs. This is the tomb of Abraham that we saw earlier from the Jewish side, but we're now looking at it from the Muslim side. The significance of Abraham and this association that was made between Arabs and Ishmaelites, the children of Ishmael, is actually much older than Islam itself. It remains central to Islam to this day. According to Muslims, Abraham is their prophet, and the religion he founded was not the religion of the Jews, but Islam. And in the Quran, we read that Ishmael helped Abraham to build a house of God at a place called Bakr. Neither the Quran nor any contemporary source actually specifies where Bakr was. But Muslims now would have absolutely no doubt that Bakr is another name for a place deep in the Arabian deserts. Mecca. the holiest city in Islam, the birthplace of Muhammad. This is the largest mosque in the world. At its center, the Kaaba, the house of God, first built by Abraham and his son Ishmael, on foundations laid by the first man, Adam. It is older and holier than anywhere else in the world. It was in the hills above the city that Muhammad received the first of his revelations from God. These revelations would form the holy book of Islam, the Quran, the very word of God. Mecca is where Muslims believe everything began the crossroads of faith and history. Surely here then, you would think, we could find solid evidence for Islam's beginnings. But there is a problem. Aside from a single ambiguous mention in the Quran itself, there is no mention of Mecca, not one in any datable text for over a hundred years after Muhammad's death. How can we know that, that Muhammad does come from Mecca? We can't. But on the other hand, if he doesn't come from there, you have to come up with an, a plausible alternative for where he might have come from. And why would you want to take that on? Why would they get on? Well, you know, that's what historians do. If things don't fit, you try something else that might fit. Here we go. So this is it? Yeah, here we are. In the Quran, the faithful are instructed to pray in the direction of a holy sanctuary. But what it doesn't ever say is that this sanctuary stood at Mecca. And to some archaeologists, a few early mosques suggest something different. We're talking about one of the earliest examples we have of a mosque. And you date it 100 years after Muhammad? Somewhere within 100 years or so. Because here, as we go into it, you can see... This is it? This is it, yeah. This is the mosque. This is the mosque. And what it's, you can... It's... What, what you can see here, 
We have an apse which is not facing Mecca, it's not facing the south, it's actually facing towards the east, towards the sun rising. This is an example of the time before the direction had actually been preferred towards Mecca. So the implication of that is that, that at this early stage of Islam, the focus of prayer has not yet been absolutely fixed. The direction of prayer had not been well established yet. And so it's, it's a bit like Islam. the concrete hasn't yet set. It's yeah. that you can still play with it, you can still fiddle around with it, you can experiment Very with it. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Not a decisive clue, perhaps. But it is suggestive that even though there are no Muslim sources, there are reports from Christian writers of the time that the Arab conquerors bowed their heads in prayer not in the direction of Mecca, but in a quite different direction. Somewhere further north. In the Quran, it never actually states that Muhammad lived in Mecca, nor that Mecca was where the first revelations took place. Does the material in the Quran point to Mecca being the setting for God's revelations to Muhammad? No, it doesn't. I mean, there is mention of a sanctuary. There is a sanctuary, for sure. Over where is that sanctuary? That's, of course, you, we can't tell. It's devilishly difficult to sort of extract what the context might have been from the text itself. In Muslim tradition, the people of Mecca are pagans, worshippers of idols. But in fact, the people the Quran describes have a deep and sophisticated knowledge of the biblical tradition. The Quran retells biblical stories and alludes to biblical stories, not just biblical, but also post-biblical developments. All this is clearly known to the audience. It suggests that what we have is a kind of response on the part of, let us say, Muhammad to the debates that were going on in Christian and Jewish communities, where they were debating theological issues and questions uh, that come out of the Hebrew Bible and come out of the New Testament. And the Quran seems to be an effort to engage in the discussion. And so there's a strong connection with the late antique religious discourses that were alive throughout the Near East. So it's obviously not a pagan world we're looking for. The people in the Quran worship a single god, but it then accuses them of praying to beings other than God. And there's something else. The people the Prophet addresses in the Quran are farmers, agriculturalists, but there was no agriculture in Mecca. Mecca does not have an agrarian base. In Mecca, it seems to have been quite an arid valley. If Mecca is this barren, infertile place, how is it that in the Quran, the opponents of the Prophet are described as keeping cattle and growing olives and vines? Mm, good question. Um, this is one of the reasons why some scholars feel that the text of the Quran is really plugged into, say, Syria. Because that's where vines and olives yeah, grow you would find much those further north. Geographical Syria, where you don't find <clears throat> olive trees in Mecca. So if Mecca wasn't the starting point of Islam, what was? If you're following the clues in the Quran itself, then you're looking for a landscape inhabited by olive-growing Arabs who have a deep knowledge of the biblical tradition, but whose worship of a single god might seem to some a little shop-soiled. This is the city of Avdat in the Negev desert. Back in the early seventh century, it was an Arab city on the very fringes of the Roman Empire. Nominally Christian, but with hints of a recently pagan past. There can be no doubt that this is um, a Christian place of worship. There are two 
crosses on the ceiling. But there's also something very interesting in the corner, which is a bull complete with horns. And the bull is an image that very probably is drawn from much older native Arab pagan traditions. That doesn't mean that the Christians who built this were themselves pagan, but it does mean, I think, that they are giving their monotheism, their belief in a single God, a little bit of pagan colour. And that essentially is the crime that Muhammad in the Quran seems to be accusing his opponents of. But Avdat had more than the right religious complexion. It also had agriculture and olives. In the lifetime of Muhammad, all this would have been green. It would have been agricultural fields as far as the eye can see. Archaeology leaves no doubt that there was a sophisticated irrigation system here that really did make the desert bloom. And so while that doesn't mean that this Avdat is the actual spot where the Quran was composed, it does imply, I think, that the region as a whole seems to fit the wider context of the Quran better than somewhere much further south in the arid region of Mecca. When you read through and through the Quran, what's really striking as compared, say, to the Bible, which is full of allusions to recognizable landscapes that we know, in the Quran, it's an effort to find an allusion to any landscape or natural setting that we could actually pin down. In fact, in the whole of the Quran, there's really only the one exception. Not far from Avdat, a strange hint about where the Quran might actually have come from. We are on the southernmost shores of the Dead Sea, between what is now Israel and Jordan. Lot was the nephew of Abraham, and he went to settle down in a city called Sodom. And the people of Sodom were notoriously racy. Unsurprisingly, this provoked the wrath of God. He destroyed his city, and this is said to be the remains of Sodom, where the anger of God was poured down upon it. And the Quran. So also was a lot among those sent by us. Behold, we delivered him and his adherents, all except an old woman who was among those who lagged behind. Then we destroyed the rest. Truly, you pass by their sights by day and by night. But if the people being addressed by the prophet are passing this place by day and by night, then what's it doing here? A thousand kilometers from Mecca. In terms of someone who is looking for clues, you are very much in the situation of someone who is panning for gold. And I think that this passage is just one little fleck. I mean, there is one possibility, of course, which is that this one fragment originated in this neighborhood. Perhaps the rest came from elsewhere. But that then begs the question of where all the various component parts of the Quran are coming from. Are they necessarily to be attributed to one person living at one time? Again, when you start asking that question, it's very hard to know how far to push it. It's